the next talk is from Alejandro, who will tell us about um, classification, taking into account that not all faults are um, as bad as the others, I think. <laughs> so, yeah, go. All right. Um, so, hello, everyone. I'm Alejandro Correa. I'm from the University of Luxembourg. Um, currently, I'm finishing my PhD there. Um, the first thing that you can note is that I change a bit the title of the presentation. And the main reason for that is that once I finished the slides with the previous title, I realized quite quickly that it was very boring. So this is my second attempt, and I think it will be much better. So it's called Example-Dependent Cost-Sensitive Create Scoring using COSCLA. Um, before I begin, I think it's important to give a bit of, uh, a bit of a background about me. So, so as I said, this is my last year doing my PhD, actually my last month uh, at Luxembourg University. In particular, the topic of my PhD has been what I'm going to present right now, so cost-sensitive classification. Um, quite cool, I work part-time as a fraud data scientist, whatever that means, at uh, Cetrail, a car processing company in Luxembourg. Um, so, in, so I say it's cool because I spent part-time working at the, at the credit card company, part-time at the university, but it's actually the same project. So it's the same long-term project doing very applied research. Um, before I started that, I worked for five years as a data scientist uh, back in Colombia, first at GE Money, then at Scotiabank. Um, I also spent a couple of years uh, at Dow Chemical, mostly used doing Six Sigma projects. My academic background, I did my bachelor in industrial engineering and my master in financial engineering. Uh, on my free time, I organized the Data Science Luxembourg Meetup. Oh, this has been running for almost three years. And uh, a couple months ago, we started running the, the big Data Science uh, Bogota uh, Meetup. Um, okay, so uh, this is the agenda. So today, or uh, this is what I'm going to talk about. Um, a very quick introduction to create a scoring. I promise this is not going to be boring. Uh, then an example of how to solve a, uh, a create a scoring problem using Python. Um, then I will go into the interesting part that is how you should evaluate a create a scorecard. Um, and finally, at the end, I'm going to present uh, quite quickly the library that I create. OK, so create a Create a scoring. Let's start in a different way. So this is, let's suppose that you are a bank and you are going to issue a loan. And you have these two guys that arrive. So the first guy just, create, uh, just founded an investment bank, and the other one just quit college. To whom do you will give the, the loan? To the banker, who, who will give a loan to the banker? I, I think that's a no-brainer. Uh, th this is the problem of giving this slide on this, uh, on this kind of, uh, to this audience. So I assume everyone will give the loan to a guy that quit college, right? So, yeah. So <laughs> then you have that the banker end up uh, creating the biggest Ponzi scheme ever perpetrated in the U.S. Actually, in the world, and the other one was having earlier. But it's very easy to judge that uh, after the fact, right? Yeah. If today you will receive someone asking you for money, let's say on a peer-to-peer -peer lending platform, and one is working in has a high position in a bank, and the other one just quit college, uh, then you will have a different uh, idea. Um, all right. So. Credit scoring, you want to mitigate the impact of credit risk in order to make more objective and accurate decisions. Uh, in particular, you want to estimate the risk of a customer defaulting uh, a contracted financial obligation using past experience. There have been a bunch of machine learning methods that have been applied to, the, uh, to solve this problem. Uh, in the literature, you find logistic regression, neural networks, so on and so forth. Uh, in practice, you only find logistic regressions, mostly because of regulatory issues, but the typical answers uh, are as well uh, interpretability of the models and implementation of the models, so on and so forth. In a bit more technical way, a create a, a, create a scorecard, uh, you want to calculate the probability 
of a customer I defaulting his loan. Here I'm representing the defaulting of a loan by the class label as the positive example, so uh, y equals 1, given x. What is x? It will be demographic information of the customer, historical information of previous uh, loans that the customer has had, uh, the usage of the credit cards, and other things. So now let's go to an example. I think this is better. So using a Kaggle credit uh, data set that was and from around 2011. Um, so there was a competition on Kaggle on using a credit scorecard data set, construct a classification model in order to predict that someone, someone with us will experience some financial distress in the next two years. Uh, the reason I use this data set is because it contains nice, uh, good information about the features. Usually, other credit scorecard data sets only say x1, x2, x3, so on. Here, there is some information about the features that, as I will show later, is quite important for my analysis. Um, OK, so you load this data set um, using a, a very small script that I have on, on this library. Uh, the information that you have on this data set is enough for you to understand the data. So you have where are the, which is the target, what uh, the name, description is a long description, uh, what are the features, what is the data. In particular, the data has around 110,000 uh, customers and the label. So in, uh, from those uh, 112,000 customers, only 7,600 are defaulted, uh, also called as bad customers. Uh, this is quite interesting because this makes this problem an imbalance problem. It's not that imbalanced, but nevertheless, only 6.7% 6 6 of the population uh, are positive or bark customers. Um, the features that this data has, so, okay, so you have the age, you have the, mon the monthly income, uh, which actually reflects that this data set is not from the US, because in the US you cannot use that feature. Uh, then you have um, historical information about the customer, so the number of, uh, so the utilization of the of the credit of the credit cards. Then you have how many times in the past he has been in financial distress. Some information about that. Um, so credit scoring is a classification problem. I want to predict which customers are going uh, are going which of uh, using information about historical customers. I want to predict which new customers are going to be bad customers. And then make a simple decision and don't give money to those customers. Um, so I first split the data set in training and testing, very straightforward. Then I train some algorithms that I randomly choose, random forest, registration, and decision tree. The very, uh, very easy way to train it. I'm using scikit-learn. There is not nothing in. Uh, fairly interesting here. Then I evaluate the results. So how you will going to evaluate the results of one of these models? So you are going to say, OK, I want to see the accuracy of the model. I want to see the F F1 score of the model, precision, recall. Um, you may say the, the are under the QF score, but in this case, we want to actually evaluate the final classification. So let's stick with these ones. And then you get a figure like this. Yeah, the figure is ugly on purpose. So first, we analyze the accuracy. And if you, as I tell before, this is an imbalance problem. So the issue with that is that a naive algorithm that predicts that there are no positive examples is going to have a very good accuracy. So in general, accuracy is not going to tell us anything in the, uh, for these kind of problems. So then we see the, uh, the precision the recall or the, aver the weighted average of the two, the F1 score, so that's a bit better. So using that information, I will say, okay, decision tree is my best model, it has uh, uh, 0.24 of F1 score, um, and that's it. You finish your create a scorecard, you go, you, if you're a consultant, you go and give the final result. If you're working as a data scientist in, in a bank, you will implement that model. But the issue is that these measures are not actually taking into account the business and econ economic realities that take place in credit scoring. So these measures are saying some information about the 
evaluation of a classification model, but are not specific in any sense to this particular problem. Um, in general, the cost that the financial institution has to incur in order to acquire customers is by all means not included in, 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 any, of these features, in any of these measures. Um, on the other hand, you have the expected profit that a, a particular client or customer will generate. So this is, of course, quite important because you can say uh, that if I decline a customer, if I have a misclassification on two customers and both are expected to be good customers, but the model misclassified them as bad customers. So I will not give money to them. But these two customers, one has a very long is requesting a very long, maybe a corporate uh, credit card, and the other one is me, so a small credit card. So, of course, misclassif misclassifying uh, the other guy have a very different financial impact, and that is something that we are not seeing in the current evaluation measures. So, that was the uh, motivation. So, let's evaluate from a financial point of view the outcome of this classification model. Um, so again, the motivation, credit scorecard models are evaluated using traditional or standard cost insensitive measures. However, in practice, the cost associated with approving a bad customer is not the same as the cost associated with declining a good customer. And furthermore, at the example that I gave, not all the customers uh, will generate me the same profit. So I have two very important issues here. Um, the way, that, uh, the way that, I, that, I, that this is solved is by using a cost matrix. So uh, this is familiar to a confusion matrix in the sense that I have. What the model is predicting, so either the model predicted positive or negative, and on the other side I have what is the actual or the grand true, if it is actually a, good cost, uh, a bad customer or a good customer. Um, I'm not going to go that deep into that, um, but after some, a couple months on doing research and, uh, and actually talking with some banks, we arrived to this cost matrix. In very general, we assume that there is no cost when you correctly classify someone, so this diagonal is zero, but when you have a false positive, meaning you decline a customer that then will become a good customer, you first are losing uh, the profit that that customer will generate. Then you have another, uh, another cost that, re that is related to the fact that you are not going to keep that money uh, idle, but you are going to use that money to, another, to give to someone else. On the, on the worst case, you have a false negative. So false negative is when you approve a customer, but then the, that customer default. So in a very simplistic way, you are going to lose the amount that you give the customer times the loss giving default. And this loss giving default is related to the fact what, that when a customer stops paying, sometimes you are going to, uh, to have some kind of agreement. So you are going to say, only pay me the half and that's it, or things like that. So you don't usually lose all the amount, but a percentage. Um, actually, I already see that. Uh, if you want to go to actually use this or, 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 uh, or understand more of this, here is the link, or I will be happy to have that discussion later. But I will stop here because it's actually a very long discussion and very interesting, by the way. Um, so how I create that cost matrix for the, um, for, for the Kaggle dataset? So in, this, in the Kaggle dataset, have the, there is some information about uh, the income of the customer, the current debt of the customer that will allow me to infer what is the disposable amount of the, cost, uh, of the customer. Then there was some information about uh, you more or less can infer that it was an average European bank, so you could make a huge assumption, assumption and estimate what is the, the interest rate that you are going to, uh, to charge, what is the cost of funds, um, loss giving default for average in Europe, and some, some other information that you need in order to calculate this particular model. Um, on the data set that I, already have, uh, uh, that I already have, this information is already calculated. Ne nevertheless, if you can use also a library if you want to change any of these parameters. 
So now, but the thing is that, okay, so now I have the cost matrix. That is giving me what is my expected loss when I make a misclassification for each customer. But I would like to know the overall results of a model. So what I, uh, what I did is that first I calculate what is the cost of the model, nothing other than the summatory of the individual cost matrices for each customer, in the sense that every time I make a wrong, a false negative, I sum that number. Every time I make a false positive, I sum that number. However, the total cost is normally not that easy to interpret, so a better way to interpret it is as savings. And the savings are defined as the cost that your model has compared with the cost of using no model, meaning of the naive model that is going to predict that there are no positives. So that's a very simple way to, um, to evaluate the savings. So this is already included in the, in the library, so it's a very easy function. Calculate the savings, it's actually making the summator internally. You have the true label, what is the prediction, and the cost matrix, that's of course is important. And here is the code, it's fairly easy. So what are the results for, uh, for the previous models that we calculate? So now we see that Randolph Forest is having a savings of 12%, logistic regression is not working at all in this particular data set. And decision tree has a savings of 17%. I'm comparing here only against the F1 score. I don't want to put too much information there. So what is interesting here is that, okay, now we have a measure to say what are the actual financial impact of the model. You are able to compare it with other measures. And a general conclusion that I have in all my talks and in all my papers is that when you compare the models by using the F1 score or the savings, in general, you are going to have different results. And it's the first conclusion in all my papers. We, I always found something like that. So as I was saying, there is some differences when in the results when you're evaluating models using these cost-sensitive measures but, or by using a standard cost-sensitive measures. Now, something interesting, 17% of savings is actually very bad. So when you go to sell the model with a 25 F1 score, okay, the guy, the, in very general, the guy that is receiving the model is going to say, thank you. But when you go to sell the model with a 70% of savings, if you are a data scientist in the bank, they quite easily calculate what is the cost that, that you have. And is that higher than 17%? Well, that is difficult to calculate. It may be, but... Um, but the other thing is that you may, you may say, okay, you are doing a unfair comparison. You are using models that are training in order to, in, in a very simplistic way, to minimize the misclassification, and you are going to evaluate those models with um, a financial measure that was not introduced at any point before during the training. So, one way to, to deal with that is by using um, what I call example-dependent cost-sensitive classification. Um, very important, first, why example-dependent? So when you talk about cost-sensitive classification in the machine learning, in more general data mining literature, you are going to find out that that is referring to the class, uh, to class-dependent cost. So cost sensitive is usually means that you have a different cost between the false positive and false negative. And the reason I make the distinction example dependent is because I'm not assuming that the cost, that, that, that different in cost is constant. I'm saying that cost is going to depend by each customer in the case of credit scoring. So as I, as I say before, in credit scoring, different customers have different credit lines, which implies that the costs are not constant. Um, so this is a model, it's the only one I'm going to uh, explain today. So one way to make a classifier cost sensitive is by using a little bit of decision theory and calculating what are the expected losses when I make a positive or a negative prediction. So in particular, when I predict that something that some, in the case of credit scoring, when I predict that someone is, not, is a good customer, then I can use the expected probability and 
weighted by the cost of that particular decision. And then on the other way around, when I predict, when I want to calculate the cost of predicting someone as positive, I do the same. I use the, the, the estimated probability by any model. I multiply it by the expected, uh, the expected cost. And now I have a measure to say, okay, if the risk of predicting positive is higher than the risk of predicting negative, then your prediction should be negative. Okay, so it's a fairly simple concept uh, taken from decision theory uh, that has quite inter interesting results. And so, of course, this model is included in the in the library. Um, I like to say that the documentation is uh, is good enough. So you have the fit function, very similar to scikit-learn. Uh, of course, including some additional parameters that are needed for training. Um, the code for this particular, for the Kaggle example, you just call the uh, base minimum risk classifiers. Uh, there is one function for fitting, one function for making the prediction, and that's it. Then we evaluate. Uh, so I make the comparison of the three models. I mean, the logistic regression, the random forest, and the uh, decision trees. And then each one combining with the, with the base minimum risk. And what is found is quite interesting. First, overall, there is an increase in savings from 17% to 42 So it's very, very, very significant, the actual financial difference. Um, then more specifically, logistic regression increased quite significantly. And the reason for that is that as this model is using the estimated probabilities, logistic regression does a, per, a very good job estimating the actual probability. So that's why that model increased uh, the results quite a lot. On the decision trees, on the other hand, the argument will be more or less the same one. The decision trees in general is not a very good model for estimating probabilities. So this model does not perform that well when using with a decision tree. Um, so, and on the side of the F1 score, we, sound, we find interesting things. For example, decision tree and the logistic regression with base minimum risk have, let's say, the same savings, but a completely different F1 score. So this is, uh, as I say, one of the conclusions that I'd like to carry around. Um, I'm going to show the results of two other models, but I'm not, go uh, I'm not going to go that deep into that. So, why, so the base minimum risk increased the savings. Uh, however, it's only introducing the cost after the algorithm was trained. So why not train the algorithm to actually go and minimize internally the uh, a proxy of the savings? So I did that with two models. One is called cost-sensitive decision trees. The other one is an ensemble of cost-sensitive decision trees. In particular, I use random patches, which is fairly similar to random forest. Again, very simplistic uh, uh, way to say it. Uh, both uh, are already implemented, so it's just a function. And the way to call it is, as in scikit-learn, you just need to include the new parameter, that is the cost matrix, that the algorithm is needed in order to be able to make the prediction. So result-wise, these two new models increase further the savings. So now we are talking about almost 50% of savings, actually a bit more in the last one. F1 score increase as well. Um, there is uh, increasing complexity by using uh, these, uh, the cost entity, the random patches at the end. It's an ensemble of a lot of these ones. Um, even though the increase in savings is not that much, um, this model I have found in my paper that is more robust. So that is why I still leave it there. But for this one example without cross validation or, or anything, it's giving uh, better results. So what I have uh, talked about so far. So again, selecting model based on traditional statistics does not give the same result in terms of savings. And the simple explanation is that those statistics are not trying to take into account the financial savings and are not created in that sense. So it's wrong to take uh, uh, to assume that the maximization of a cost incentive statistic is actually trying to maximize the profit or the financial income of, uh, of the business that is using the model. 
Uh, moreover, models should be evaluated taking into account the real financial cost of the applications. Algorithms should be developed to incorporate those financial costs. Um, so now the last part of the presentation, I'm going to talk very quickly about the library. So the library is built on top of Scikit-Learn, Pandas, and, and NumPy, as expected. Uh, there is a bunch of different algorithms. In particular, it, of course, the one I did through my PhD, but there are there are some others. There are some data sets. So, so there is already some data set with some with the cost matrix already calculated. So that I think that's a very important contribution, because one of the issue in the research in this field of cost sensitive classification is that there are not good enough data sets that actually uh, you have all the financial inf information. Now, this is, not the, this is not an issue in a company. I mean, in a bank, all the data sets, you could include all the financial information associated with each particular loan. So in industry, you will find that you have all that information, but on the academic data set that you find around in, in UCI or so on, you, ha you don't have that information. Uh, there is a lot of future work. Uh, there is an, uh, the need for speeding up all the, actually all the algorithms. Um, I did not include so far the class-dependent algorithms. I know there are some implementations around. I have used some, but there is a need for, uh, I think it will be interesting to put everything together. Uh, and there are more things to do. Okay. So that was my presentation. Thank you. OK, so we do have some time for questions. So questions, anyone? So thanks for that talk. That was very interesting. So during the panel earlier on, I think someone mentioned about the business case and the cost, you know, of, of implementing something. So do you feel that kind of fits into that kind of making data science business friendly and, you know, managing expectations and stuff like that? Do you feel that this is a very important comp contribution to that kind of area? Um, okay, so uh, thank you for the question. I will say that as I work part-time in, in a credit card company, um, and I used to work before in a bank, I have to make two presentations every time I'm, making, I'm going to present a model. The presentation for the university and the presentation for the bank. And the presentation for the bank only have one slide. What are the financial savings? And that's straightforward. They understand that, and they know how to fight against that. The university one has okay, whatever measure or everything that you need to have. I'm not saying you don't need to have it. But in some sense, that allows to have a very easy conversation between the academic and the industry. And extrapolating to your question, of course, from a consulting point of view, it is way more easier when you are going to, if you sell, sell the model, of the financial savings that is going to have the model, other than the reduction of mis misclassification. Yeah. Um, thank you for the talk as well. I also thought it was very interesting. So um, I have a question. So um, as I understand, you included the cost uh, for each individual loan. Do you think the model can be extended to also include the possible profit for every loan so that you uh, have a look at the costs as well as the profits. Y yes, for sure. Uh, you might say that uh, you can model a cost matrix as a profit matrix. And in general, I would expect to have similar results in the sense that you can model what are the expecting profit of each customer, and then the, the, the cost matrix more or less invert. You know? so, so, of course. Um, or you can have, uh, in general, a um, yeah, profitability metrics. So you put all, not only the cost, also where are the, the financial profit that each customer will generate. Um, it's, it's actually up to you. 
more important of to which information you have. Yeah, and sometimes it's easier to find uh, to model the profit than the expected losses. Okay, thanks. So this is the last question, I think. So thanks for the talk. Really interesting. Um, one question: Why why you didn't try to include this code in uh, Scikit-Learn, for example? Okay, so fair question. I when I start doing this, actually, um, sorry for. Uh, for the very unpopular comment. I start on Python because my advisor told me to start on Python, and that was three years ago. Uh, so it was not until recently that I feel that this code is, uh, let's say, good enough for something like that. Um, that, is, that will be, of course, something quite interesting in order to give more continuation to the project in general, and I definitely will try to do something like that. Thanks. Okay, unless there are any very urgent questions, I would propose that we thank the speaker again. Oh. Thank you.